The Titanic is considered as one of the most luxurious ship to ever exist, but it's not as glamorous as it seems to be. Hygiene procedures and supplies on board the Titanic, like most other aspects of life, were controlled by class. The lower the class, the less hygienic. The ships back then were not a joyful place to be in. Third-class passengers had to prove they were clean merely to board the Titanic, while first-class passengers took advantage of some of the most opulent eating, entertainment, and bathing facilities ever found at sea. According to history, the Titanic was the largest seagoing ship ever built at the time of its May 31, 1911, launch. Even if it hadn't sunk on April 15, 1912, its numerous features and ludicrous size meant that you would probably never have the opportunity to examine it completely. According to the history press, the Titanic was not just an engineering wonder, but also a significant artistic achievement. With opulent interiors and stunning designs for the time, the ship was built to live up to the magnificence of its name. Many of these wonders are now submerged beneath the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. Have you ever wondered how those on the Titanic kept themselves clean? Let's find out then. This is History Rediscovered, remember to support our channel, please subscribe. In this episode, we discuss how hygiene was like on the Titanic. Third class went through mandatory medical and lice examinations before boarding. Third class passengers had to go through a thorough inspection before being allowed to board the Titanic in order to prevent any potential infestation, disease, or lice, among other things. No people traveling in first or second class received any sort of examination, but steerage ticket holders were welcomed by a team of surgeons led by Dr. William Francis Norman O'Loughlin, and inspection authorities outside the ship. If they were declared clean and healthy, passengers exchanged a portion of their ticket with an inspection worker for an inspection card. In a sense, the inspection card served as a boarding pass. O'Loughlin led a medical team on board the Titanic while serving as the ship's surgeon and senior surgeon for the White Star Line. Dr. John Edward Simpson, the assistant surgeon, attended to the second and third class travelers. When William Dunford's body was discovered after his death during the sinking, a medical thermometer was among his possessions. He worked as the hospital steward. According to reports, Stewardess Evelyn Marden served as a nurse for first-class passengers, analogous to Catherine Wallace's position as matron in third class. Moreover, O'Loughlin and Simpson examined the crew, certifying their fitness for duty to Captain Maurice Harvey Clark, the Board of Trade Immigration Officer. They were only two bathtubs on the Titanic. The first-class tickets ranged enormously in price, from $150, about $1,700 today, for a simple berth, up to $4,350. $50,000, for one of the two parlor suites. Secona class tickets were $60, around $700, and third class passengers paid between $15 and $40, $170-460 pounds. If a single wash basin shared between six people sounds meager, consider that there were only two bathtubs available for use among the 1,000 passengers in steerage, one for men and the other for women. So the opportunities to bathe would have been minimal. If you were a third-class passenger, chances are you would have gone the entire voyage without bathing. But if you were a first- or second-class passenger and you wanted a nice bath you arranged it with a steward and he sets a time for you. It wasn't in a very opulent and comfortable space, but it was manageable. You were directed to one of the bathrooms that was close to the toilet because they were all located in the center of the ship to make the piping easier. While there were public restrooms on the ship, most living quarters did not have private restrooms, therefore those who did not purchase luxury cabins had to relieve themselves in the chamber pot provided for each room. Yet, passengers who were seasick frequently utilized these pots. According to an artifact show at the National Museums of Northern Ireland, this is how the chamber pots earned the moniker, Vomit Pots. The opulent Turkish baths were available to passengers traveling aboard the Titanic for the price of $1, approximately $30 in today's money after inflation. The National Museums of Northern Ireland claim that in addition to having toilets, this room also had steam rooms and electric hot beds. The electric bath, which was made at the time and was designed to warm the body, resembled an iron lung or a modern tanning bed. Pictures of the Turkish bath depict ornate Moroccan-style windows and rich wall patterns. This setting would be considerably more comfortable for personal hygiene than a bathtub with 1,000 other people sharing it. Only a few cabins on the Titanic had private bathtubs, one of which was occupied by Captain Edward Smith. Smith enjoyed a porcelain tub that could be filled with fresh water or seawater, both hot and cold. Only the third class had access to automatic toilets. Although there were sinks and toilets in many of the cabins on the Titanic, the toilets in first and second class did not have an automatic flushing system. Passengers were required to manually flush the restrooms after using them, just as they would have done on land. Nonetheless, third-class restrooms have automatic flushing systems. 
This was done out of fear that steerage passengers, who had hitherto used mostly outhouses and chamber pots, would have little to no experience with a toilet. It was done for them because they might not have understood they needed to flush. In addition, matron Catherine Wallace offered help to third-class travelers. Wallace was responsible with assisting immigrants in steerage and, if required, instructing them on how to use the bathroom. Wallace was rumored to have remained on board the ship with the passengers under her charge, dying along with them when the Titanic sank. The ship was a smoker's paradise. According to the vintage news, if you wanted to smoke a cigar, you wouldn't have to go far on a ship carrying close to 8,000 of them. The several smoking rooms that you can encounter as a passenger are described in detail by the National Museums of Northern Ireland. After dinner, the men in first and second class would typically make their way to the smoking lounge, which also had areas for drinking and playing cards, if they fancied a smoke. The room was outfitted with matching oak furniture and embellished with magnificent stained glass and carved oak walls. The smoking area, which also had a bar and spittoons for chewing tobacco, was a popular hangout for third-class men. Women were not permitted in the smoking area, so if you were a woman on the Titanic, you had to either stifle your want to smoke or make your way topside to smoke covertly on the deck. Social customs of the day kept women apart, and many males utilized smoking at the time as a method to socialize with other men. Among each of the social classes on the Titanic, gender created a social class. What did people eat on the Titanic? With more than 1,000 passengers and crew on board, Titanic was sailing with thousands of pounds of food, including fruit, vegetables, and meat. Like ocean liners today, the Titanic was also sailing with thousands of bottles of alcohol. With a long stretch of time at sea, passengers spent time eating, drinking, and relaxing. First-class passengers enjoyed sophisticated meals and were fed the best of any passengers on board. For breakfast, lunch, and dinner, first-class passengers enjoyed continental-styled food in formal settings. Passengers sailing on second-class tickets were served a more classic menu on the Titanic. These passengers were served mostly British food options, unlike first-class passengers who were served French options. Although passengers sailing on third-class tickets were the lowest tier on the Titanic, they were served surprisingly good quality food. For most, the food served in steerage was better than what they were used to at home. For third-class passengers, breakfast included protein, oats and fresh bread made on board. Options for these passengers included ham, eggs, oatmeal, smoked herrings and potatoes. Class impacted who survived. A Senate inquiry was held to look into the catastrophe and what went wrong after it happened. The study came to the conclusion that class had no bearing on lifeboat distribution and that it was not taken into consideration when placing individuals in lifeboats after hearing surveying crew evidence. Third-class passenger cabins were the furthest away from where the lifeboats were launched because, as Roger and June Cartwright explain in Titanic, the myths and legacy of a catastrophe, the lifeboats were on the top deck. Had a crisis occurred, third-class passengers would have been trapped in the hallways with a thousand other people while attempting to ascend to the lifeboats, which the first-class passengers could have more easily strolled to. According to history, various explanations for the disproportionate number of third-class victims who perished focused on the language barrier or the fact that they were too terrified to flee. In The Night Lives On, Walter Lord makes the case that the testimony at the hearings unmistakably demonstrated that the men and women of third class were purposefully held back. Further investigations, according to the review De Epidemiology et de Santi Publique, revealed that discriminatory practices contributed to such a high death toll among third-class passengers, including inaccessible lifeboats, a lack of crew backup, and blocked escape routes.